This is Jessica Sachs, and I'm going to be emceeing the uh, first few sessions here. And on that note, it is my pleasure to introduce Michael Kalkowski. He is the co-founder and creative director of Game Duel. The company was founded nine years ago, and they have produced over 65 games in their own studio. Game Duel is based in Berlin with a team of 200 people. They also have an office in San Francisco. They have over 80 million users across multiple platforms on their own website, on Facebook, and on, and on smartphones such as iOS and Android. GameDuel is also known for their great company culture, so if anybody here is looking for a job, I hear they're hiring. So talk to Michael after the session. He just told me that GameDuel has over 25 open positions. So if you want to know more about that, touch base with him later. And everybody, please welcome Michael. Thank you, Jessica. Think about the world's greatest companies, the world's companies where people really love to work, that have such an amazing culture, that people love it there. Think about your favorite companies from internet, technology, games, companies that you admire for what they have created. And think about the people that built those companies, the CEOs and the entrepreneurs that built them. Picture some of these people right now. Here's one of them. Do you recognize him? This is Mark in his dorm room. This is 10 years old. This was the first Facebook office. Quite impressive that he was just about to start one of the world's most successful tech companies. Let's go a little bit farther back in time. These guys, do you recognize them? Yes, yeah, Sergey and Larry, the Google founders, in their first office. This was at a garage in Menlo Park in the Silicon Valley. This one's 35 years ago. Anybody knows these guys? Especially this guy here on the bottom is very famous, Bill Gates and the Microsoft founders. Also impressive that these hippies founded a company that today is worth $230 billion. One of my favorite ones is this. It's a bit more difficult. Who knows the man in the whirlpool? <laughs> this is Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari. And the funny thing is, this photo was not taken during a vacation the Whirlpool was standing right at the Atari office. This was one of the first investments the company made for the team. They had a Whirlpool. Pretty cool culture back then. Looking at these examples, what strikes me is that when companies start, they're pretty wild places, pretty cool, innovative, creative, even a bit crazy. And then as companies grow and become bigger, they become more like adults, and they turn into something like this. I call them zombie companies. They're like boring places and a lot of hierarchies and a lot of bureaucracy and they're slow. I heard many horror stories about companies like that even in our industry, in the games industry. And for me as an entrepreneur, one of the most fascinating questions is why does that happen? Why do companies turn into this? I would say 80% of the companies, and it usually happens after three to five years, they, they hit a, a point and then they turn into these zombie companies. Why does it happen and why do some other companies, like Facebook is a great example, they manage to grow and become bigger and stay lean and vibrant and fun places. What do they do differently? What is their secret? I think there's four secrets. There's four keys to this. And the first one might surprise you. It sounds a little bit counterintuitive at first. The first one is about performers. It's about getting more high performer people into your company as you grow. I'm talking about people like this, guys that are very self-driven, motivated, easy to manage, very experienced, people that have a huge impact on the organization. Getting more people like that is a key. Why is that important? Are you familiar with Netflix Culture Bible? It's a 
brilliant document where they talk about their guiding principles for the company. And one of the things they talk about is exactly about the relationship between growth and high performer people. As the company grows, also at the same time complexity grows. We all know that. And complexity grows like even more over proportionally to the growth of the business because you have more people, you have more games, you have more projects. You may even have studios in different countries or time zones. It just becomes very complex, very complicated. At the same time, most companies, the percentage of high performer people in their team stays pretty much the same. Or for some, it even goes down because if they grow very fast, it's very hard to hire enough great people. And this creates a problem. At some point, the complexity just outgrows what the team can handle and it creates chaos and people start making errors and they get confused. And as companies see that, what they do naturally, they introduce a lot of processes and structures and bureaucracy and rules and regulations. And of course, that is exactly also the cause for companies turning into these zombie companies. And the worst thing about that, it drives away the high performer people. It's like a, a downward spiral because these people don't like to work in this kind of environment. So what can we do about it? There's two things we can do. We can stay small and keep the team very lean and small and vibrant. Or if you want to grow the company and get bigger, then get more of high performance people into the team. Netflix even say you have to over proportionally increase the percentage of high performers as the complexity of your business grows. And only that allows you then to introduce processes and regulations at a much smaller pace. What's the percentage of high performer people in your team right now and how has it changed over the last month? That's a key. What's the second key? The second key is then once you have these people to create a culture and the environment for these people to thrive and really be at their best. And that is about freedom. Are you familiar with Drive, the book from Daniel Pink? It's a brilliant book. He talks exactly about this. What motivates people? What drives us? Is it the money or is it a status or a nice business card? Is it the projects we work on? What motivates people, especially creative people? And what he finds is three things, and one of them is freedom. He calls it autonomy. When I talk to the people in my company and ask them, for you, what's the most important thing that motivates you? What, what makes you take what drives you? Most people, what they say is, I want to make an impact. I want to be able to make my decisions, be flexible, get the freedom, get responsibility, have the flexibility to choose how I tackle my problems, have enough time also to experiment, try out things, even make some mistakes. That's very important. At Facebook, new developers, they push code on the very first day. They get a lot of responsibility. And I'm always surprised when you give people responsibility, it's almost as if they want to show back to you that they deserve it, that they deserve your trust, and they outgrow themselves. You might say, well, then a lot of mistakes happen. Why can you give people so much freedom? It really depends on the industry that you're working in. If you're an airline pilot or if you work for a nuclear power plant, then the cost of making um, a mistake can be huge. It can cost a lot of lives. And the cost to prevent that mistake is quite small in comparison. So they have a lot of rules and safety procedures. And there it makes sense. But in the creative industries, it's different. There the cost of a mistake is not so huge. And often the cost of preventing mistakes is much bigger. So that's why Netflix suggests an approach they call rapid recovery. You give people a responsibility. And then if a mistake happens, yeah, then you quickly fix it. But you don't need a rule and a corner case for everything. Freedom also comes from thinking about things and questioning things, how, how you work. Why do we have to work the same way that we've been working for the last 50 years? Why do people have one screen or why do they have two screens? If somebody comes and says, I might be more productive with five screens, why not 
give them five screens. We have people in, the, in our office that have five screens. Freedom also comes from the way you structure your team and organize it. Spotify is a great example. There's a brilliant document from them. It's called Scaling Agile at Spotify. Um, highly suggest reading it for you. They talk about how they structure their teams and tribes and guilds. It's very Scrum-like. We also do this. We reorganized our company about three years ago, and now we have 200 people. Most of them are organized in these small agile teams, teams of three to eight people, and they all sit together. It's cross-functional. They talk a lot on a personal level. This has really had a huge impact on communication and on the team spirit. Very important. What's the third key? Third key is about growth. Because if you look at the most creative companies and the people in there, what they really want, they want to grow themselves. They want to learn. They want to become better like artists. They want to become masters. Initially, we didn't really understand it too much and value that too much. We thought, why does Google have the 10% time? What is that all about? But now we understand that it's really important also to balance work and growth and personal growth for the people. If you don't give that to the people, they will eventually leave. So we have a lot of things in our company that fosters that growth and enables people to grow. And it's not so much sending people to some seminars. People can grow most by learning from great colleagues, by having really stunning colleagues and working together with them. So we have things like peer programming, and we do a lot of events, like this one here, where people from the team talk to the team. We do it in the morning. We have free breakfast, and then we meet for communities of practice. Somebody from marketing might talk about how we do mobile marketing, or somebody from the finance team explains how to use Excel spreadsheets and create pivot tables. And people love that. They, they, they go and learn from each other. We also bring in a lot of external experts into the company that coach our team. We get world-class speakers from all over the planet, like here is CTO of Amazon, Werner Vogels, who gave a talk about cloud computing, very interesting. And by the way, these, these events, many of them we make open house, so people from other companies can also come and listen in. We want to share this knowledge. But it's also good for recruiting, because then people come for the talk, but they see our team, they see our culture, and some of them afterwards apply for a job. Growth is also about personal growth. We had some people that after a while, after a couple of years, they said, I want some time off, travel the world. So we support that. We had just somebody come back from several months traveling the world. They come back with fresh ideas, inspired, or somebody that wants to make it, go out and study, take a degree. We support these things. Personal growth is also about changing your job, maybe. We had one person in the, in the team, he was one of our Flash developers, and one day he came up to me and he said, uh, Michael, I th I, you know I'm a Flash developer, but I think I, I might be, uh, want to become a game designer. I think I might be a pretty good game designer. And I said, okay. Yeah, why not? Let, maybe we can try it. I'm glad we tried it because this guy turned out to be a really good game designer. And now he runs a whole unit and is with the company for almost seven years. That's also about giving people opportunity to, to grow in the company. What's the fourth key? The fourth key is about passion. A lot of companies, as they grow bigger, they lose the passion. They lose the passion for the customer. They lose the passion for what they do, really. And that's sad. And you might think this has to do with the number of people in the company, but there's examples like, you know, Zappos. Zappos is a great example. They have 1,500 people, and the people are absolutely passionate. They're obsessed with the customer. They're obsessed with the team. They even have other companies visit them in their headquarters, looking at how they do it, how they create that passion. Compare that to the typical call center or customer service team at many large companies. We also have a team for the customers. We call them customer ninjas. And one of their jobs is to bring the passion into the organization and share the stories from the, t from the customers. So the couple down here, they, they met 
playing online multiplayer game. They didn't know each other. They chatted and then they met offline. And now they, get mar they got married. Beautiful story. Also, the man up there, that's Walter. Walter is 95 years old. He's Germany's oldest online gamer. And he's been playing on our site. His wife taught him how to, how to use the laptop. And now he's playing Scott on our site. These stories, bring them back into the company. That creates passion. Passion comes also from having a strong purpose. When Steve Jobs recruited John Scully in the 80s for Apple, and John Scully was the CEO of Pepsi Company, Steve told, asked him, you know, John, do you really want to continue and sell the, the sugar water in the bottle, this crap? Or do you want to come to Apple and change the world? What do you want to do? Passion comes from having a strong purpose. And we, in the games industry, especially in the casual games, we have a strong purpose. We make people happy. We bring people a great time. We make people smile. We bring smiles on the faces of millions of people every day. That's, that's great. That creates passion. But if your goal as a company, if your mission is just to become the next $500 million company or make so and so much revenue, that's not going to motivate people. Bring the passion into the team. These are the four keys, and there is actually a fifth secret ingredient to all this. Something, if, if you mix it in, it's kind of like the magic sauce, if you add that. And that is about the team. Having a strong team culture. A lot of companies, when they grow, they create departments and compartments, and the team spirit goes away. It's very sad. So you have to work actively against that and do things to, to bring the team together again. Little things like, Team lunch, we have that every Wednesday. We bring people randomly from the different teams, from finance, from marketing, HR, and bring them together for lunch. And that creates a good vibe in the team. Also, it starts with the, with the office itself. In our old office, we had three floors, and people had to take the stairwell to go from one to the other. Of course, they never did. They just sent an email instead, and that was really killing communication. And people started talking, oh, the guys from the third floor, the guys from the first floor, really bad for the team spirit. So when we moved into our new office, we went a long way to change that and tore down all the walls, put in a lot of glass. We even dug a hole in the floor and put a stair right in the middle of the room. So now it takes 30 seconds to go up and down. And that really helped communication a lot. Little things like that. Team spirit is huge. It has a huge impact on the performance of the company. There's a great book, Tribal Leadership, from Dave Logan. And he talks exactly about that, how companies with a strong we culture, with a strong team culture, consistently outperform companies that have an individual culture with a lot of egos and divas and superstars. So these are the people you don't want to have on your team with a very strong ego. They, they're very competitive internally. And I've seen people like that. They destroy a whole team like that. So be very careful. I'd like to share a little story about Team Spirit, we had one project where we wanted to launch a game for Christmas. And we thought, how can we motivate the people? Maybe we give them a little bonus so they really make the deadline. And then the team came back after a while and said, you know, we think this is not such a good idea. We don't want the bonus because this is just because the five of us are on the team. What about the rest of the company? Maybe we should get something for everybody. Maybe we should get something like a pool beer table for everybody. And you'd be surprised. As soon as we announced that, it created an amazing vibe in the company. Everybody was coming to that team. Wow, oh, how's it going? How can we help you? Wow. And for sure, we made the deadline. And here, this is our lounge. And that pool beer table is a daily reminder of how great team spirit can really transform a whole organization. There's a lot more stories to share about this, so we've created a website inside gamedoll.com where you can watch videos about our team, about our culture, learn more about it. I also like to hear your stories, your experience, what, what are your best practices. So please send me an email if you want to talk about it. I love to talk about this subject. I believe if we work together, if we share these experiences, we can really grow our industry and avoid becoming zombie companies and make it really the best the greatest place that it can be.
Do we have time for questions? Okay. I have a question. Hi, Bobby from <coughs> Early stage companies really have a problem uh, getting performance to work with them. Mm -hmm. You know? Why did you do at the beginning to, to hire this kind of people? I mean, it's an issue. Can you? Yeah. So, Bobby from Avonhut, early stage companies have really big issues in, in getting performers to work with them. They're mm -hmm. unknown, they're unknown quantity. Uh, they, they don't really know if they're going to be there in 12 yeah. months from now and, and so on. What did you do in the beginning to, to get these kind of people? How did you approach them? Mm -hmm. How did you convince them to join GameDuo? Yeah. In my experience, there's two kinds of these high performer people. Some are, they come for the money, they come for very, like want to work for a big company with a big name, but there's also high performer people that really love the challenge of a small company where they have a huge impact. So you really look for these kind of people. It's not, I would say it's not that difficult to find the right, if you find the right high performers and not the ones that just want to work for the big name company. And then if you, if you go for the performers that really want the challenge and they share your vision, of course, you have to meet with them, you have to talk about what are you building, really get a connection, they have to be able to work with you as the starting team. But my experience, there's a lot of people like that that you can find. More questions? Okay, I don't see any more questions. And thanks a lot.